You know, fools of the world. I mean, how foolish can you possibly get? Everybody, you come on, we all know you built those bathhouses for yourselves. You built the marketplaces to prosper personally and for your nation. Not at all for the Jewish people. If the Jewish people benefited, and they did, it's because of me, not because of you. So I think it's the brisker rough who asked the question, why shaitim ba'olam? Why does it say fools of the world? Why not shakranim ba'olam? Liars. You're liars. You guys are lying. You know it, I know it, we all know it. You're, you're just big liars. Why fools? So he explains, because that's what they are. They're not liars. They're right. They're saying 100%. All that we did was to somehow further the cause of Torah and the Jewish people and the Gula Shleim. But they're called fools because God says, if you think for one second that I'm going to believe that that was your intention from the very beginning for the sake of, of my purpose of creation, forget it. No way. Come on. You know, I wasn't born yesterday. I wasn't born at all. Fools. World class fools in the end. So it all has a positive toelis, but it doesn't mean that you're potter because you did the wrong thing. God says, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take your Avera and the, and the crazy thing that you're doing and the Mishugat, and eventually I'll use it for a positive thing to further the cause of the fight of redemption, but you don't get any reward for that. That wasn't your intention. Your job is to do it the right way, because quite frankly, it's much simpler for me, so to speak. I mean, obviously everything is simple for God, but it's much more straightforward Effective to do the right thing and use that to contribute to the final redemption because learning Torah and do it directly contributes. It doesn't have to be contorted, distorted, to fit like a like I don't have to do what has to be done the proper way. That's the ideal cause and effect relationship of creation. But you have to know that is something. A way to, to be much less toward the wrong reasons. Higher spiritual level because Muhammad, what's Muhammad? Muhammad is life itself. Chazal point out that even though about uh, real war, also talking in the level about every single day of life, as the Mesil Sharm points out, that we are always going into war. You wake up in the morning, you're going into war. If you don't feel the war, you've lost the war. If you're not doing battle until the day you die, you've lost the battle. You, you've, you've lost to the end. So that's why the end of the Parsha, tell you, the middle of the Parsha connects up like two days yanta with Cholmud between the middle of the parsha is all connected. One, you know, every mitzvah is always connected and follows the other. But the end of the parsha is a sikum, and the sikum, the end of the parsha, about the second place of Torah that talks about uh, right towards of uh, of the weights, the proper weights, as Chazal point out. If you achieve the marketplace, eventually the result attack by Amalek, right? And the parsha ends up towards the end, right? The original parsha uh, parsha Zachor. Zachor is uh, Zachor Asa Lecha Amalek Besichem in Mitzrayim. Right? Remember what Amalek did to you when you left Mitzrayim. Leaving Mitzrayim, it's a par- it's a parable. It's a mashal. It's a paradigm. Right? Leaving Mitzrayim means leaving the world of the Yefes Tawar, leaving the world of simply pursuing things for desire's sake. Mitzrayim was a seichel less place. It was a place that people did things because it felt good, because it's what they wanted. It's because it was what they, their hearts you know, desired, regardless of whether it was moral or not. It was an immoral place. Mem tu means all heart, no seichel in the end. Do what you want, because that's what feels the best over here. Leaving Mitzrayim, he attacked you because you didn't completely leave. Your hearts were still there somewhere, like Lot's wife fleeing and looking back towards stone. Because her heart was still there. Physically, she had left. They say later on by the Moraglim, let's appoint the leader and go back to Mitzrayim. Right? So therefore, Amalek, which represents spiritual doubt, intellectual doubt, attacked you. You had doubtful thinking. You were, you were, um, you were not clear about what you were leaving behind. He met you along the way. The Lashon Kar, so she points out, is the Lashon of coldness, right? He made you cold. He cooled you down. Whatever, however inspired you were, you lost inspiration, Right? 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 And he, he attacked the stragglers behind you, the people who were weak in Torah mitzvahs, as Rashi points out, and he had no Yerushimai, no sense of God, no fear of God whatsoever, right? And this has to end. He says, uh, When you finally overcome all your enemies, specifically the Itzahara, because the outside enemies are only a physical manifestation and projection of the inside enemy, 
of the Jewish people. You inheritance to inherit. Don't just destroy Amalek, but eradicate every last vestige and memory of Amalek. Don't forget Amalek. Is really this is what it's all about. Amalek is the blindness. Amalek comes specifically to say to somebody, you know, what you're doing might be a cause, but who says there has to be an effect? Who says, who says there has to be an immediate effect? Who says you can't get because maybe Tamish will change. Maybe God, if he's even there, will forgive you. Maybe God doesn't even pay attention. But all these men, it's the person that risk. And the whole thing falls through. You look at I do by thinking and how even the thing that seem fixable in the Metake are not completely fixable. There's a price to pay. You might turn things around. You might do tshuva. But there's a cost. There's time involved. A person who has to sit down and do tshuva, a person who has to sit down and make amends with the Kodesh Baruch is taking up valuable time that might have been used for something else. Yes, once the Averis tshuva, tshuva is the most wonderful thing and the world was made for tshuva. Fantastic. But at Tzadik, somebody who doesn't have to spend the time doing the tshuva to make amends, to go back and rectify things, yeah, we like to justify and rationalize and turn the situation around and make the best of a negative situation. 100%. Don't cry over spilled milk. All the stuff is true. But don't spill the milk. So my son says, you know, knocked over the, you know, the drink and spilled it. I said, I, I, I knew that was going to happen. That's why I told you, don't put that cup in this. But so he says to me, don't cry over spilled milk. Up. You're right. It's spilled. Don't, I'm not driven cry 100%. But how about we don't spill it in the first place? How about Hacham Enavar Right? What about the wise man whose eyes are in his head? what's the situation is today and deals with it now in the present before it gets out of hand and not have to go back and rectify and fix things up. What about that? What about the ring on the side of the paper like that might get knocked over? What are the chances? They're pretty good. Much better than we think half the time. Gee, didn't see that coming. You know, should have, should have seen that coming. You know, that, because you know why? When God runs the world, the odds could be 10 billion to 1 that you're going to fail. But if God is the one, that's good enough. So why would God do it? To teach you a lesson. He says, if you're not going to be sensitive to the causes, well, you might, I'm going to have to show you firsthand what it means to be responsible. By making that effect that was 10 billion to 1 that could possibly happen, make it come true. Randomly, but derech nature, but derech teva, it wouldn't have happened necessarily. But I run the world. There is no teva ultimately, especially when it comes to a Jew. Especially when it comes to somebody who wants to grow, who got sloppy, got lazy. To sensitize, to wake you up to reality, fine. This is what I have to do sometimes. To make you realize that every cause has an effect. If not today, then tomorrow. And if you fix it up in time, it still costs you somewhere along the road. Time, money, effort, agmas nefesh, somebody else agmas nefesh. You walk over and you say to the person, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. And the person says, thank you for saying I'm sorry. Okay, but there was a moment in time the person felt pain. And it was registered. And it changed the world. And who knows what that person did because of it at that time and the, the cause and effect relationship because of it along the way. All over. Boom, 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 boom. Chacham e'nabar rishon. Somebody who's got seichel, somebody who understands Someone who doesn't simply rationalize and justify, but on the contrary, he says, you know, what if, what if, maybe, possibly, is it worth it? Can I justify it? What if? God says, you're asking what if? Call the kavod. Very good. You're somebody who Amalek won't attack. You won't be spared. You won't be affected by the doubt. And because of that, I will protect you. You protect yourself, protect you. And on Rosh Hashanah, I will give you a good.